All right, how's everybody doing today? Of course, we have a chat window you can work with. I want to make sure everybody can hear me okay. I'm going to start out with a certified security sentinel. <laughs> Happy Friday for sure. So essentially, we'll go, we'll do a little bit of time on the CSS, and then we're going to go to the CVA class. And then after about an hour, we'll take a little break. And we're going to do some CISO. Of course, let me know if you have any questions. I, I, I assume it's just okay to, to go ahead and start. Unless there's any special request. Perfect. All right, so you can see my screen. You can see basic security on my screen. Perfect. All right, so I go ahead and start. Uh, we're going to go through three chapters here. Basic security, how to secure a computer for personal internet use. And as we're looking through this, there are definitely risks online. We think about hackers, we think of identity theft, definitely. And of course, what end users do or not do or should do. And of course, setting up security products. So I know you guys have gone through some uh, video learning. I'm just going to try to kind of go through this and fill out any gaps we may have. So we know there's a lot of threats out there, especially in the world of PCs using Windows, and that is the primary platform. So it's not necessarily a competition. Do you have a Mac? Is it better than a PC? And so on. It's more of, it's just an obvious fact that there's a lot of PCs out there. And there's therefore, virus makers are probably going to target them more and, and pursue them because we're going to create a virus you might as well get a lot more people involved in it. That's probably their perspective. So with this, uh, Windows machines especially have to be, oh, is this to do that? Okay, hold on one second. Um, oh, Bill, how do I do that? <laughs> Just got a chat message here. Let's figure this out. Um, there it is. I found it. Okay. I told me to click a button. I had to find the button. Okay, now I got it. All right. So, you know, with, with, in our world, since there are so many PCs and so many little hackers out there trying to mess with us, we, we know that we're just on constant defense. We really have to be kind of with it. Ian. Okay. Okay, and with this, I think I've got the recording started already. Okay, so we're going to learn more, and you know what you don't know will hurt you. I mean, there's, there's, that's definitely true. And with when we think about hackers out there, they're trying to find any opportunity to, to harm us. And the things that we do on the internet, I mean, they're all risk. I and mean, if we're going to use the internet, we're going to have this. And as you can see right there in the list, and especially like if we do the auto fill in and have the system remember our information, I think that's a really big bad thing to do. Because, you know, your system can be compromised. And, of course, you're, you're, what about the cookies? I mean, your system, your Internet Explorer, Firefox, they remember places that you've gone. I mean, there's cookie information that's been stored. I mean, there's just a lot of security things. And in a company environment, hopefully they use something called group policy. And they would go ahead and restrict a lot of this because it would be for our benefit. So you connect to the Internet, uh, you know, you have a lot of, risk coming your way, especially if you use something that's not protected, like for example Windows XP these days would be a problem. As it's more of a risk being that there's no patching being done with that, and even if you do have something more modern, then still if you're not really secure, it could be quickly harmed. Okay? And with anything, I mean just being on the internet, even if you think that you're really good, and you don't go to like Pirate Bay and some of the bad sites, you still can get harmed if you don't really have security software in place. I found going out and looking at RV sites, going out there and looking at security things that we talk about in class, I found viruses trying to come down to my system, but thankfully I've had, had items on my system to protect me. So that's, that's helped a great deal. And, you know, there are fake sites. I mean, I could, because of the time, we obviously can't, like, itemize every single thing on the slide, but there, there's a lot of fake sites and decoys and things you can get on your system. We have to be very careful, okay? 
So, so did you know if someone were able to access the internet from your home when a crime was committed, the odds that you would be held responsible? I mean, definitely, I guess it's similar to if there's a, a robbery and you were the driver of the car and you didn't know your friends went in and robbed the store, I mean, it could come down to you. So we want to watch what happens on our connection, absolutely. And the hackers do have different skill levels. When you have the ones that just use script kitty tools, tools that they find out there that are easy to use, but they're kind of clueless on how they work, uh, all the way up to the people that are pretty smart with this. And don't think there's not a lot of hackers out there. The identity theft, when you think about that, I mean, we have information out there that uh, that can be compromised, and then someone can try to act like us. You know, they get. Well, we have to be more careful with that. I have a a relative who posted a, well, it was her basically her application to law school, but then she had a picture of her driver's license, and I said that is not good. You know, she said, well, if they want to find it, they'll find it. But I certainly wouldn't make it easier with this. You don't sit there and say, here's my social security number, here's my driver's license number and try to make it much easier for them because, you know, you could be identity theft could happen from some of this information that we're really sloppy with, okay? Okay, I should get on the right page. That would help me. Okay, <laughs> moving on. So, you know, a lot of this is security awareness and, and being really careful with what we do. Maybe paying attention to our credit scores and, and making sure no one's out there trying to Create, put credit cards out there in our name. And if we think there's been something that's suspicious that's happened, maybe we should check into it and you know, just kind of keep an eye on things. And, and there are websites out there that are, you know, claim to help you and then you can pay pay money to to try to you know kind of keep an eye on things and make sure there's not somebody out there trying to put credit cards in your name. Uh, it, I guess it's just being aware of things. With anything, I mean, we could get downright paranoid and say, you know, the sky is falling because of all these bad things that are out there, but we just kind of have to realize that's the environment we live in, and we're going to have to kind of keep on guard. And it, it really, it's not that tough. I think in a lot of ways, if we use good practices and we keep our antivirus up to date, we keep our anti-malware up to date. And of course, if I miss anything in the chat window, let me know. I'm trying to watch it. If, you, if, I tend, if I happen to ignore you, if you say something. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, so i got some new arrivals there. All right. So that was that little chapter. Now, you're going to find the first section we go through this first little book is actually kind of short. It's the second one that's got a lot of heart to it that we'll be going into. After these three little chapters, we'll get into the next one. Okay. User awareness. I think this is something we absolutely lack. Uh, users just have some of the worst practices. I could sit there and think of my own family members and relatives and what they do. It's just it's amazing. It's like, well, is the password with whatever 1234 okay or the pin code 1234? I'm going, no. 9999, no. Uh, you know, we have to be aware of not using super easy passwords. And when people put numbers in their passwords, I say, what is it, your last four of your social? Because many times it is. And you know, we, want, we do want to have good security, and that's some of the things we're going to be looking at through here. Well, there was a hacker out there named Kevin Mitnick, and he went to jail. <laughs> He's out. He's famous. You know, <laughs> the usual drill. Sorry. Let's see. There it is. See, I've searched this before. Kevin Mitnick, Art of Deception. He actually wrote a book about it. You can kind of look him up if you want to. But he actually wrote this book, and it was all about social engineering, because human manipulation is can be easy to do with those that you know feel confident doing that and, and acting out the part, and they can definitely do that. And I mean, you may be out there needing some help with your computer on a computer forum, and then someone says, "Oh, I'll help you," and you let them in your system, and they put back doors in your system, and you never know. You know, people get tricked because I think people think they want to be helpful. They trust, but that's not necessarily the thing to do when it comes to computers. You have to always be on guard. You almost want to say trust no one because there's all this trickery going on. And the Kevin Mitnick hacker, he wrote that Art of Deception, but in his storyline of what he did, if you watch his movie, I think it's called Takedown, it actually showed a lot of uh, social engineering going on. Absolutely. 
It was amazing. <laughs> I got to see the movie, by the way. It was really great. Okay, so uh, we, we still have to think about teaching our users and, and over and over again security, and we may feel that it's a waste of time, but if you don't, they're going to make worse mistakes. Okay, so we first need to shut the door to people trying to gain access maliciously to use our information. We have to be aware of this. Our passwords are actually really critical, and I know we want to use super easy passwords, it would be nice to use passwords that were based on our hobbies or our pets or spouses or something like that. But if people get to know you, they might be able to figure out your very predictable passwords. I mean, I have a relative that did one called Chevy Aveo. I was like, oh, that's good. You know, you know, there was no uppercase, no special characters. There were some numbers in there that was somewhat clever. You know, they could do better. And, you know, you should change your passwords regularly. I know it's really hard on the user. I'm pretty bad with passwords. You know, we've got one extreme. If we get too hard with the passwords, people write them down. But if you're too easy, they're too hackable. And there's too many password crackers to help with that. You so say never use whole words or common dates, addresses, especially not ID numbers. I mean, you do, and people do that. They absolutely do. I mean, they, I think they love to use the last four of their social. I'm beginning to see that pattern. I'm beginning to think people should just, like, come up with some other numbers if they want to use them. Okay. Yeah, and you could use, there's, there's, soft, there's like links here they have that could help you generate passwords. You'll have to debate whether you think that's a good idea because sometimes they make really hard passwords that people still aren't going to remember, and they're probably going to put them on sticky notes and put them under their keyboard. So, I mean, you don't want people to make them accessible. I mean, if we can go around your desk area at work and find your password, it's done something wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not a good thing. Okay, there are the products out there such as this that are designed to have kind of like a master password. You know, I mean, you have some you have can hide all this, keep all this information. I'm assuming whenever I hear the sound, is somebody joining in because I'm not seeing any chat questions or thoughts. Okay, but yeah, I mean, there's there's all these products out there that are supposed to protect your information, but you know, you have to decide whether you think that's secure. I kind of think it's just a matter of time before people find all this information. So they're suggesting use it in e-wallet, store your passwords in a file that no one can read without the master password, but the master password would be the kings to the kingdom. So you could use a USB drive, a key ring, so that you can always have it with you and not on the computer. That, that's kind of intriguing when you get to plug something in. And the autofill is bad. You know, I've started learning from just friends and relatives that I help out. It's like when I go to log them out or get on another system, I say, do you actually know your password? And usually the answer is no, my computer knows it. My computer remembers it because you have all this auto, well, we're just, you just tell it to remember it for one. Or you might have it auto fill in some of the information for you, and that can be risky. I mean, we do have biometrics that could be used, which is where you can read a physical characteristic like your finger or your hand, your face, your eyes. Could have a uh, military like to use smart cards, and they'll actually have these. They call them common access cards, and essentially, it's they have a special reader that reads that. Um, passwords. You don't want the passwords to be too close to your computer. You certainly don't want them written on sticky notes near your computer. And there is a the main account in Windows is your administrator. And we definitely think of that as the, it's the main account and everything. We, we try not to log in as administrator too often. I mean, Windows 7 is trying to force us to be more secure. And, you know, in a business environment, you know, we would try to make it a habit to log in as our regular user account. Now, Windows has something called processes. You can go into Task Manager. Control-Alt-Delete is uh, one way to get there and choose Task Manager like they're showing here. And you can click on, you see your applications, you can click on your processes and actually see what's running. They're going to show that in the next tab here. And you see what's running, you can see how much memory it's using. You might see a process that should not be there. And, you know, that would be something if someone actually paid attention to what was there. I'll admit, I think most of us don't necessarily know what processes should be there. But we could, I mean, maybe if we did some screenshots and kind of paid attention to it, we could get used to what should be there. And, you know, there can be, there's kind of picking on a particular process, and maybe you have a particular process, and you could go look into that. You could do a Google search. You could go, 
um, you know, go to Microsoft or Process Library or something, do some sort of search, and they're just showing a couple examples to uh, maybe identify what is that process. You know, perhaps that it happens to be a, a hacking, you know, a, a Trojan or some backdoor into your system. Okay. All right, and who just came in, just go ahead and mute yours if you would. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, you can go and research these processes if you don't know what they are, trying to figure out why they're running on your system. It would be easier if we started out fresh and got to know what should be on our system, and then we'd be more likely run into recognize things that should not be on our system. I mean, I'll admit I don't sit there and know all my processes. I do depend a lot on antivirus and anti-malware, and I do keep it up to date. And, I try not to like go to anything risky, especially on my main Windows machines. If I'm going to do anything, look at hacker tools, really look around. I'll admit I use a Mac for that because I figure there's going to be less viruses for the Mac. That's, that's the rationale. And sometimes I'll go in with a virtual machine, which you guys learn about a little bit later. But with virtual machines, it's kind of a self-contained environment. And if I mess that up and I get infected, I can always destroy it and start fresh. Or go back to maybe a snapshot that I have. So, you know, they're suggesting, like, these good tool sets. I mentioned Norton and McAfee and all that. I mean, it's not perfect. It, a lot of it has to do with good behaviors. You know, there are some people that I, I set up numerous family and friends, uh, their computers up with the same exact protection, for the most part, that I have, but then they still come running with infections. So it has to do with their bad habits. It has to do with them clicking it on going to websites with no regard and clicking on pop-ups and doing everything without paying much attention. So, I mean, there are, you know, nice tool sets are called these startup tuners. Uh, just some examples. I mean, Windows Defender is like an antivirus that you can use, and that's built in. There's Microsoft Security Essentials. I mean, there are other tools like MS Config that, I don't want to get lost on this, but... I typed it in. It's trying to catch up. Come on, computer. But it's MS Config anyway. And with that, I can actually control what starts up. It's being really sluggish, so I'm going to move on. Okay, and always download from systems that you you trust, or from sites you trust. I mean, be very careful if you're not familiar with it. Well, if you're going to get a driver, you're going to get an update. Get it from the source. Uh, preferably, <laughs> get it from the source, okay, because they could actually have some information. They're, they're giving you what you asked for, but they're giving you some backdoor to your system, too. So it's important, you know, to keep yourself up to date. It really is, okay. Users have to be extremely careful. As I said, I really like malware bytes. It's an excellent tool, and I was actually try, looking at some graphics, some images for a prior class, and it popped up and said, we blocked this for you. We say this is malicious. So you can have that online protection sometimes if you purchase tools like the Malwarebytes. And the, as far as the email links, uh, we have to be you know, careful because we don't know what that's going to take us to. We don't know what things are going to take us to. There's so much, you know, so many little things out there that can cause harm. We have to be really careful. There's the MS config. It finally came up. You can control what auto starts in here. I'm going to type MS config. And I could go in here and deselect something that I don't want to auto start. That's kind of a nice one. I like that. So I can control a lot of that too. Let's see slides. Okay, one more. Hmm. Okay. Uh, dealing with countermeasures. Implementing countermeasures here, when and how to use them. Oh, yeah. Antivirus, anti-spam, anti-malware firewalls. Who, who knows what you really have on there? I mean, I personally keep antivirus and anti-malware in place. And of course, the built-in Windows firewall. Everybody's got their preference on what antivirus to use, and then I believe in an additional anti-malware product. And then a company would hopefully have some sort of something to filter spam. And it may not be something you keep on your system. I mean, you could have some full-blown Internet security product. And whatever you have, though, keep it up to date and keep your scans going, okay? And you can go out and read different surveys, and we could go on and on about which one's the best. I mean, I, I generally use free antivirus tools. 
Yeah, but you know, everybody has their faults on what's the best. I've read more than one survey, okay? And many of them are free. No one has an excuse for saying, oh, I can't afford an antivirus. They're free. Okay, you just have to make yourself do the scans. And then, yes, you can't run really two antiviruses on one system, but you can run an antivirus and an anti-malware, and they won't really fight each other. That works out real well. But, you know, a big thing is that sometimes people buy brand new computers. They'll give them a, a, a temporary subscription to McAfee or something, and then it will expire, and then they won't do anything, and then they're not protected. So you got to keep that up to date. So, you, you know, that, that is critical. I mean, because new viruses come out, and if we don't have any, we don't keep it up to date, we, our system does not know about the new viruses, and it doesn't know what to do. It doesn't recognize them. And I've discovered just letting my system just do its own scans that it has missed things. I have intentionally go into my antivirus and say run a full scan. And I intentionally go in there and make sure it's updating sometimes. Just want to make sure it's doing what it's supposed to do. I found things doing full scans that, that my regular scans did not find. Okay. They're suggesting at least once a week a lightly used systems. I mean, you could do it more often. They're saying multiple times a week. And there's a lot of different products out there. It's kind of like, it is definitely personal preference. But I like to read surveys. I like to get feedback from people. And they're just kind of showing off that there are patch management tool sets out there that can help. I mean, what I think of actually is WSS. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a Windows one built into Microsoft. You just go get that. Okay, Not so much the one we see listed here. Some people use anonymizer type tools to make activity more untraceable. I just do is do a quick look. Some people look. I'm having a delay here for some reason. There's Tor. We can become anonymous. And there's a Tor browser. Some people might use this because they feel like their privacy is being potentially exploited. And that's free. Uh, there's a box pin. This is like a subscription one. I've, I've actually played with this one before. I'm not actively using it, but I, I really like it. And it's just kind of like a concept of being anonymous and, and encrypted and all that. And people pay like $3 a month, and you pick your servers, and you go through, and you look like you're from that given country. And it has all this encryption, uh, these different uh, virtual private networks that it's given you with up to uh, some pretty good encryption and for a pretty cheap price. So... That way, you're, you're feeling like you've got some more anonymous features. So, of course, they show you a couple examples there, too. And they, they're, a lot of times they are using something like Secure Shell, some sort of encrypted communication, uh, and that's good. I mean, or it could be using other encryption methods to keep you secure. But there's generally some sort of encryption built behind it, okay? And, yeah, I mean, there's, there's in your browsers, I mean, we do have... I should probably use Internet Explorer for this one. Oh, I mean, you've got all kinds of little features. They call it different names in private browsing or incognito or different ones that you can actually run and actually run in a more secure environment, you know, more of an anonymous environment. Okay. Oops, click that open. All right. So we'll do. So that takes care of that particular, just kind of looking at those three chapters for CSS. So we're switching over to CVA. Hold on one second, sorry about that. My headphones got attached to something when I'm trying to reach for my book. Sorry for the loud noise. Okay. Okay, the next one we will look at, hopefully I'm still attached and everything's still good. I'm not seeing the same screens. Currently, so we'll go on to uh, the next course here. Just give me one moment to reattach everything. Are there any questions about the first course before I go to the next one? Okay, got everything right. So, no questions. All right. 
Okay. So, you know, of course, that was a pretty basic, basic subject that we looked at. This one will probably have to struggle to get through everything I need to get through because it's a lot of slides, a lot of information. I'll try my best to be fast. Okay, so I understand for the CVA, Vulnerability Assessor, we're to go through three chapters. Yep, one, two, three. Okay. All right, so you still see my screen unless you tell me otherwise, and you still hear me and everything is okay unless you tell me. Uh, vulnerability assessment. Well, that's a big one. Okay, we're going to be looking through this information. There's all kinds of different vulnerabilities to look at, making sure we're compliant. And what we're talking about doing is finding out where we stand, okay, and making sure that we are secure. I mean, that's a big part of it. That's not a complete step through. I mean, what you need to do is do a vulnerability assessment, see where your vulnerabilities are, and hopefully have people come back and do testing, which is they play, where they play hacker. Okay? And so you are identifying, quantifying, prioritizing, and just trying to see what you have. Quantifying, you're putting hard numbers on something. And you're just trying to really look for our vulnerabilities because we'd much rather find out what they are so we have a chance to fix them than to actually wait for the hacker to find them. Okay, So with this, it just to be to be systematic and so on, so that makes pretty good sense. And it, it's not really, I mean, we have many reasons for doing a vulnerability assessment. It might be something we're required to do. It might be something that looks good as far as our company image, and maybe it's for cybersecurity, insurance, who knows? I mean, there's, there's reasons, and basically we're talking weaknesses. With, and we may have weaknesses we don't even know we have until we run this vulnerability assessment. Okay, So the in, whenever they use the letter NVA, it's Network Vulnerability Assessment. You want to find out what your flaws are with the goal of trying to fix them. It's called mitigation. And really, this is so such a great slide. It's one of my favorites. The fact that, I mean, let me see if it colors it a little bit more. Basically, product ships, the discover, vulnerability is discovered. We modify something, then there's a patch. Patch is released, but then there's a, a delay before we actually put the patch on the system. People may say, well, I've got to test it. How do I know the patch is not going to break our system? So there's going to be some sort of delay with that. So we have to make sure companies, we want our companies to get a little faster with that deployment. We want to make sure it gets on there quicker because you've got an opening, a door open to the hackers at that point. And of course, if we think about, you know, if you talk about a vulnerability assessment, um, they're, they're kind of just getting down to the fact that we need to spell out what's going to be involved and who's going to be involved. And because you may not be doing this for your entire company, what is really the scope, I guess? And you need to declare the scope so there's not a, a debate about it. Okay? They're suggesting that you put together kind of an overview of what you're trying to accomplish, make sure it's clear and readable. And they keep saying projects come to grief because the scope of the project was poorly defined. It needs to be spelled out. We need to know precisely what we're doing with a vulnerability assessment. We don't want to, we want to cover everything we're supposed to cover, and we don't want to, you know, maybe cover something when they didn't want us to cover. And when you think about vulnerabilities, I mean, that could be anything that exists. I mean, they're right. I mean, anything from the different services, the operating systems, your different types of servers like the email and the, the web and you know, all kinds of systems, connectivity and the network, absolutely. Then we don't have our switches that secured or about as secured and so on. And then there's, there's just things that happen that are well beyond that. I mean, there's just, you could really read into these pages and get a lot out of this. I mean, there's, just, there's things out there that try to harm us. I mean, even internally, we have people that might just get upset and try to do the company in because they feel like they weren't treated right. But they say a lot of the uh, threats are from the inside, not the outside. <laughs> but, you know, computer viruses, um, computer hackers, and, and so on. And these are some nice little definitions that they put here. When you think of the risk, it's the overall, overall probability that the threat is going to actually exploit that vulnerability and harm you. And the threat could be what caused you the harm the event, the person that did the hacking, threat impact, how bad was it, whatever happened. And we can't assume that everything is because of a hacker. I mean, it could be a big snowstorm came through <laughs> or a hurricane or whatever it may be was, your, was the, the bad threat, the event. 
So it can have, you know, an impact on you, of course. Probability, I guess, the chance that that event will occur or that specific loss value can be obtained if it were to occur. And we try to put in uh, safeguards, countermeasures, controls to reduce the risk. We don't ever eliminate the risk. We try to reduce them. And if we don't put something in place, we might say we have a vulnerability. Okay. So you have this uh, network vulnerability assessment here, and there's, there's different methodologies to follow, but you do want to definitely plan it. So they're just kind of taking us through the steps real quick here. Looking at there's any particular legal things to take into account, uh, documentation, known bugs, vulnerabilities. And so and there, are, there is a leadership in this. I mean, you have teams of people. You have points of contact and so on. So, the, so some really good points there when you think about your interviews, information reviews, and so on. And then, of course, as far as analysis goes, actually the acquisition of the first document only ends in the generation of the draft, as we put it, draft report during this phase. And we're looking at a lot. We are. We're looking at risk analysis. You have to look at your security policy. We kind of we live by the security policy, I think, in analyzing the threats. So, and you do have to prioritize and figure out really what is that critical, what's the most critical. Okay. We never eliminate risk, we reduce the risk to something we can live with. And a lot of it has to do with how much money we can put into it and time we can put into it. To do a risk assessment, we do have to look at the companies, you know, what, what are the assets, how much are they valued to be, what could hurt our assets, do some mathematical calculations, think about loss. And it is a really big battle because you are trying to predict what could happen and, and you're thinking about what the various variables are and, you know, trying to put numbers on something that may or may not happen, really. So risk analysis is important and we have to think about what realistically could happen. You don't want people just from one department. You get people from different departments. And, and there's a lot of different tools that you can use. I mean, there's automated tools that can assist you with some of this. Uh, you can come up with scenarios. I mean, you have to put some time into this. And when you think about how much is that server, that asset worth, we think of the, I mean, what did it cost? Okay, maybe that wasn't a whole lot, but what would it cost to replace it? And it's more than that. What did it cost? To, what did we put into that asset? What do we use to develop it? Who, the bad guys, the adversaries, what would they pay for the asset? They may think that asset's worth way more money than you ever paid for it. Okay, <laughs> cost of maintaining it. I mean, there's, there's a lot, and I like this last one, liability if asset's not protected. I mean, if you, it's sometimes it's worse if you think about it, if you don't protect it, what bad things will result, okay? And people don't really get security, and there are vulnerabilities out there that exist, we, but we may not really think of, okay? People don't get the security thing. Uh, people may have permissions from one job function, but they get moved into another job function, then maybe another again, and each time their privileges get bigger and bigger because people forget to take away the old ones. And maybe we're not enforcing separation of duties and, you, and saying you can do this, but you can't do that. Maybe we're being too nice with the privileges. We always need to have an incident response plan. We need to think about I guess we also just have to assume that something could be happening, uh, even though we wish the best, we assume the best. Okay. And with risk, I mean, you have some risk that could happen after a particular event happens, but there could be something that could happen delayed. I was actually on a call to risk. We were talking about this just this week in class. The fact that say in Florida, people got hit by hurricanes, and then people did some repairs, and they thought they were okay. So, but there was a delayed risk, or a delayed problem, I think called a risk, but a, a delayed result from it, where people found mold in their walls. And it was like, they thought they were okay, they thought the repairs were done, but, or maybe they saw a little bit of cleanup. They never dreamed there was some, something that was going to show up later. And, you know, and that could be obviously a problem. I mean, think about losses. I mean, if you have some sort of uh, vulnerability and then it's exploited and everything, we think of potential losses and you're not as productive, you can't do the you know, can't you know do your regular business operations, repairs, consultants, revenues, customers, and again there could be delayed. Even if you get back on your feet quickly from some sort of event, so something somebody hacked into your network, people know about it. I know I avoided the target store for quite a while. 
after I heard they were hacked. I actually did. I, don't, I wonder how many people did that. Maybe that was a delayed loss. They had loss in reputation, uh, loss in potential customers. Maybe there was late fees, you know, so on. And when you try to analyze it, if you do it mathematically, it's quantitative. If you do it based on opinion-based and some things you can't do mathematically, it's qualitative. You might come up with a rating system of a one to seven point scale, seven's the worst, one's the best. Versus quantitative, you actually put in hard numbers and try to do predictions. Um, companies do think probably more from a quantitative, they think financial, because that's why they got in business versus government, uh, they may think, well, what we do is so important and we're protecting its national security, you can't put a money value on that. So they may think kind of a different way. But again, the qualitative, I mean, you could sit there and do surveys, you could do things that are more anonymous, Delphi method, and they basically rank, maybe it's on a high, mid, middle, or low rating, or maybe it's a one to seven point scale type rating that you're doing, seven being the worst, one being the best. Maybe you've seen this before where you can figure out based on you know, something that could happen. You say, what's the asset worth? How much of it was uh, affected? Exposure factor, that's a percentage. Multiply that and you get how much you could lose per event, SLE. Versus you could calculate, once you get that number put together, you have a single loss expectancy. Uh, with that figure, times how often does it happen per year, ARO. And it may be that that event doesn't happen hardly ever. So even though your SLE was pretty large, it was such an odd event to happen, maybe it's once every 10 years or once every 100 years, that it ends up being a pretty low amount. And the reason you do these figures is to kind of figure out how much money you're going to spend uh, to, you know, to counter it, I guess. So. You know, we use these values to try to help us, you know, prioritize, figure out our security budget, figure out our countermeasures, and there's kind of showing in your book some mathematical functions where they just put the formulas together, but you do definitely look at predictions of a single loss expectancy and then figure out how often it happens per year, ARO, and then you come up with, you know, how much should you spend to pay, you know, to deal with this, this threat, and you may find that it's not cost effective. So I'm going to kind of move through these because it does make a big impact based on how often it happens. Okay, so there's going to show in a few pages of you know different situations and you know maybe your SLE is big but your ALE is not too big and you figure out whether you're going to put a countermeasure in place. That's always understood that you can't go purely quantitative. It could be kind of a combination because how do you put a number on reputation for the company? How do you know? the potential customers that will be lost, it hasn't happened yet, or a loss of market share. Maybe down the road you could go back and look at how much you lost, absolutely. So it, it really comes down to how much you're going to spend on the countermeasure, okay? And you, you want it to be cost effective, that's kind of their obsession here, is it needs to be cost effective. If it's not cost effective, they don't figure you should do it. You should probably accept the risk or purchase insurance or do something. And when you think about a countermeasure, it's not just get buy the product. Sometimes there's a maintenance fee. Maybe there's a learning curve where people have to learn how to configure the product and work with it, and things like that. And of course, you can't ever really get rid of all risk. And some of this is not really pure math, but they're just kind of showing you that there will be residual risk. Okay, total risk versus residual risk. I mean, you think not mathematically, but logically, that there's threats, there's vulnerabilities, you have assets. And even after you put a safeguard in place, there's still residual risk. And there's some things, a control gap, there's some things you just can't protect against. And as far as what you do with this, you could transfer the risk to an insurance company, you could uh, reduce the risk by putting a control in place, a countermeasure. You could just live with it after you've ana analyzed it and said this isn't cost effective. Or you could Basically, you know, that would be the bad one, reject the risk. You know, you need to make sure you're knowledgeable and you're aware of the choices and then make a decision intelligently there, but you wouldn't, would not really just completely reject the risk. I mean, normally that would be considered pretty negligent. You want to look into it and make informed decisions and make sure it's a good decision to your, in your opinion. Okay. And, of course, they're talking about kind of different approaches. 
Chair, sure, policies establish the direction management wants to go with regard to security. So really, I mean, we do look at policies, and policies should be kind of driving what we're doing. Okay. And look at some of the basic definitions. I mean, you could have your main high-level policy, but then you could have some other various policies that relate to it, whether it be general security, topic-specific, or system or application-specific policies. I mean, you, there's, there's so many various policies, but the main thing is policies are mandatory. They're not optional. Now, some policies may be because you were forced to. It was a regula regulation. Or maybe it was an expected behavior advisory, or maybe it's more of a non-enforceable one that they're doing here. Informative. This would be an exception. Told to teach employees about specific issues, that one would not be enforceable. But normally policies are considered enforceable. There are some industry best practices out there that you could look up on different ISO standards that you could Google, and it tries to cover uh, you know, different security aspects, such as this one says a range of controls for implementing security. And then some, some places actually might be certified to this level and they have to make sure they're compliant. But again, standards, compulsory, baselines. You basically, a lot of this, the guidelines are the optional. That, that's normally what you see there. But you may have a minimum level of security baselines. You may have procedures that spell out the policies and so on. Okay. So again, lots of policies out there. And you want to make sure you're actually following your policy. I think that's a big one. And they're saying more of a technical perspective, when we think about network vulnerability assessment, we might consider doing, kind of looking at site survey, developing a test plan, a toolkit, conduct the assessment analysis, and document what you found. And of course, let them know what you found. So this uh, chapter has been all about why vulnerability assessments are important. Okay. All right, this one, next chapter in the CVA, we're looking at vulnerability types. Okay, this chapter's not too bad. All right, and vulnerability types, looking through this one. Critical vulnerabilities, information leaks, and all service best practices. Okay, there are some things that are just flat out critical that you attend to, and it's just such a big deal that we must do something right now. And as had some students this week, and we we're talking about this, and absolutely, they were talking about how when it comes to something critical, they just act rapidly, very rapidly. When we think about critical, uh, potential critical vulnerability types, I mean, these are some of your big ones. I mean, you got the the buffer overflows, and it really is. It's like a programmer's written information, uh, written a program that accepts information, and you want to make sure you validate how much information you can take. We're going to actually be looking at these, most of these directory transversals, format strings, default passwords, and so on. So let's look through here. Buffer overflows is really big. That's kind of like in your top 10 web vulnerabilities that we see out there. And, you know, with the buffer overflows, it's super simple. It's just a matter of the programmer writes a program, they accept input, they do not validate the length of the input, it ends up overflowing the buffer in memory that's meant to hold the input and they end up writing over something else in memory. So that's a really bad thing. Okay. Then, of course, there have been attacks based on URLs. There are people who have manipulated URLs and, you know, play, kind of played with that. And now, normally, you go to a web link and you see something like this, serve the path, the application parameters that you might have in there. But there have been hacks that are kind of like the one at the bottom where they've messed with this and they've used you know, done something that should be, you know, HTML related or URL related, and then they go to, like, a Windows directory, System32 command prompt, and get a directory listing of the C drive. That has obviously worked. Now, you know, what you're seeing here are some historic things that have occurred, I guess, in computer history. Okay. Uh, format string attacks. I mean, again, manipulation. Uh, you know, with, with the format of the, you know, format information. And they're saying that this could be used to execute an attacker's code, causing a denial of service, or even taking complete control of the system. And there are absolutely exploits out there. Default passwords, that is a no-no. <laughs> now, basically, we have a lot of uh, 
systems that do have a default password, but it would be good to change it. If you Google default passwords, you run into a lot of these good ones, especially up here, and they'll show you all your mainstream software out there, uh, you know, Netgear routers, sys, uh, Linksys routers, and different routers and other equipment that could actually give you the default username and password. That needs to be changed. Absolutely. There is a, a white website you could Google sometime called, called OWASP. It's Open Web Application Security Vulnerabilities, or pro projects, what they call themselves. And they do maintain a top 10 on vulnerabilities that you can kind of check. The current one, you could go back to even 2004, and you will see some of the same issues. It's pretty pretty interesting. Okay. So, and there, there's some that get out in the news that you find out the very vendor you're working with has got a backdoor in your system. I think we all probably all suspect it, but, you know, sometimes it gets out in the news. Okay. I say in one of classifies information links will allow attacker to gather information about your system and to in effect conduct network reconnaissance. That means information gathering. So I mean there's just so much out there that we can extract information from uh, you know things in memory uh, and, and so on. The network information, I mean we can get information about a network. And there are various protocols to try to extract that information. Uh, I guess one of the most noteworthy ones on this page is SNMP. If you use some sort of a, I would say front end graphical interface type program like Cisco Works or HP OpenView, you could get information about critical systems. I mean, it could be firewalls, routers, switches, servers, anything that you found useful. There are, in, in the world of hacking, you know, a lot of times the different vendors will tend to advertise a lot of detail about what they are, and finding out the version information could be helpful to a hacker, too. So it is a, too much information is given out, and it helps the hacker figure things out, and therefore search for a, a way to compromise your system based on you giving that exact information out, exactly what software and what version you're using. I mean... There's been concepts where you could, you know, extract information. They're talking about little sessions. You could find information about users. Windows 2000 was really bad about something called null sessions, actually. You could extract the usernames, not the passwords, but the usernames, the group memberships. You could figure out if they were an administrator or not. It was, it was pretty good. To null service, you're usually just trying to cause harm. Okay. Okay. Just go ahead and mute your screen, mute your system if you could. <laughs> this is like you not following procedure. That would actually <laughs> Okay, can you guys still hear me? Just let me know in the chat window. Just what? Can you still hear me? Good. Okay. I just hit a button and I wasn't sure if I did right. Okay, so with the denial of service, it could be one-on-one -on -one or it could be many, many systems attacking the one. That's why they call it distributed denial of service. Okay. Uh, and, of course, you know, best practices, so while best practice vulnerability might not expose a currently exploitable hole, it highlights the configuration or setup is not in conformance with industry agreed upon standards. I mean, there are references is all they're saying that you could go and Google it and try. There's lots of sites you could try to help us find out what the vulnerability, what we should be aware of and, you know, things that might be currently exploitable. So hopefully that gives us kind of the, the basics of it. Okay. Got one more to do in this chap, this particular book, Assessing the Network. Okay. So yeah, let's see how fast we can go. <laughs> it's a lot to go over. Okay, assessing the network. Okay, with this chapter, all about assessment, numeration, scanning, network services, a little bit about Unix, Unix world, and virtualization. We have a lot of different things out there. Uh, I'll tell you something that's really popular. is called virtualization. Uh, there's, you see a list of products there. I don't know what your favorite is, but... You know, VMware is really, really popular. Microsoft's got the Hyper-V and uh, VirtualBox I hear people talk nicely about sometimes. And you are able to run, I'll just give you a quick little look. I have VMware on here. Hopefully it'll come up. And then basically VMware has different virtual systems 
We'll see if that comes up in a little bit. I'll come back to it. Okay. And when we think about talking about operating systems, I mean, operating systems used during a security assessment will depend on the type of network you're going to test and so on. I mean, you could use different systems. We think about many different systems for, uh, you know, for our assessment. Let me try this again. Okay. This is uh, VMware. Yeah, it's not coming out quite right, but basically the product would come up. Yeah, it's acting up. I'm just going to have to close that. It doesn't usually act up. I probably should have rebooted my system. But uh, I, I have Linux in there. I have Kali Linux, Debian. I have Windows 2003, 2008, uh, Windows 7. I mean, I have all kinds of different operating systems that can run virtualized on top of this one computer. So a pre pretty neat environment. Okay. So a lot of different operating systems. There is something out there, if you Google it sometime, called Metasploit. And it is actually used for exploits. Okay. And with that, uh, you, know, you just Google Metasploit and you'll see it as it's really known for actually doing the attack. Okay. Not just the vulnerability assessment. I think you'll find it be interesting. I mean, there's so much that you could enumerate, which means you want to extract that information. You want to gather that information. And it's just all over the place, domain information. I mean, there's so much information gathering that's done, sometimes even well before you hack, actually. Uh, search engines, oh yeah, news groups. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of searches that are available that you can search. Um, a lot of footprinting tools. Some of these are, most of these are free. Some cost money. I mean, you have your general internet lookups that you can do. I mean, you can do uh, you know, different news groups, Google searches. Facebook, a lot of people use that. So I could friend you on Facebook just to try to find out more about you and kind of social engineer you, by the way. <laughs> a lot of who is lookups. I don't know if you've tried some of these. You can actually Google these. But this is kind of a super valid point. I mean, the fact that someone might be out there on a forum just chit-chatting and saying, we bought the Cisco SA540 for office. And, you know, they're basically spilling information. And that, that's a problem. We have people, they mean well, they're trying to solve a problem probably, but you just sort of announced it to the world, you know, I mean, especially on the internet. And then sometimes there's actually job listings that will advertise what they want your skill base to be, only to find out that you've just, uh, you know, told them what you have. So the hackers are pretty excited too. Okay, so things get inadvertently posted and it's sometimes, unfortunately, it's publicly viewable. You know, there is a really neat, you could actually do uh, Google hacking. There's actually a book out there. But at the same time, I don't think I dare search for that right now. I'm a little tight on the time. So the, the Google hacking, if you search out there, yes, there's a book. But I know there's a free resources by Johnny Long. And you could get like a pretty hefty size um, help, help on this. And it's, instead of like most of us, just go to the Google and just search for a word or a couple words. You could actually do a lot more and do some advanced queries. Now what they're showing on this screen actually is if you Google for the Google Hacking Database, you'll be taken to a website and they'll, they'll pre-make these queries for you and you can then do searches and you can a lot of times find information uh, much better than you could otherwise. You, you get to fine tune it to exactly what you want. I mean you can also do advanced searches I mean, there's a lot of information. You're not hacking Google and Google's not hacking anybody else. So just simply using search queries like these, uh, you know, just looking for a website with a certain name. I want certain words to all be in a title or all be, to be in the URL, or I'm looking for certain file types. I mean, I can be very restrictive. There's a whole world out there on Google hacking, and a lot of it's free. You don't have to necessarily buy a book. Uh, you know, people do domain name registrations, and this information as, uh, you know, Sometimes you can actually get information about a company because of their domain name registration if they have not anonymized it. Okay. Who is lookups? You could again find out more about these domain name registrations and they might give out some good information. That's what they're showing here. And of course, this is just a routing protocol and you know, that, that could be informative also. Domain name system, DNS. When we think about that, uh, I know that was keeping up with 
the information from the, the name of the domain name and the, the IP address. You can sit there and use the computer name that you can get there. And there's like a whole hierarchy of these records you have. You know, the typical host record, computer name to IP, pointer record, IP back to computer name, uh, and, and my like Internet Explorer will have something configured wrong and I can't get anywhere with that. But if I can make NS look up work, I know I'm good. I just have to figure out what I did wrong and what I've got configured. Maybe a proxy server got configured and I forgot about it. Okay, just a little bit more and we're about done with this and we'll take a break. I dig is like a Unix equivalent. You, although you can do NS look up just fine. There's like programs out there, by the way that will try to help crawl websites and get information, extract information. Black Widow is what I remember. WIC2 is good too. Okay. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's, there's tools out there that will just, again, try to automatically enumerate and extract information. Um, email related, probing. That and NMAP is a port scanner. It's a very good one. If you ever really get into vulnerability assessments and pen testing, probably should just go ahead and give into something called Kali Linux with a K, K-A-L-I. And uh, Kali Linux has this NMAP tool already built into it. There's a lot of resources on that, so it's good for port scanning. They even have parameters to deal with networks where they've like turned off some of the features that you would have normally needed. And like the ping test, and you could still get by and get information. There is a Zen map, which is like a front-end graphical interface for this. Port scanning is super critical because it tells us what, what machines are there and what they're running. So we're trying to target a machine. We want to do various port scans. Uh, you might do a full three-way handshake. And we, you, there's like a TCP connect port scan, which will be the most thorough, but probably the most detectable. And based on the response, you could declare whether it is an open or closed port. And there's just a ton of options. You could spend some time on Nmap. You could get a book on Nmap because it has so many options, but you kind of play with it and see what you like the best. But it is the de facto port scanner, okay? And there's other various port scans that may be less detectable by an intrusion detection system, and that, as we see, that will not complete the three-way handshake like the SIN scan. Uh, actually, here's one half open. And the response, you know, whether it's open or the response, whether it's closed, you'll have different responses, okay? Uh, of course, you can, a lot of times, you may run into a firewall, which can be, you can get a response from that, too. You may figure out what services they're running and what exact versions of the web server they're running. And, you know, sometimes we want to know the, you know, whether there's, what operating system they're running and what version they're running. Sometimes you might try a different protocol entirely and use UDP and see what you get. Because sometimes it's a little trial and error because you may have certain things blocked in that given network, but you don't really give up. You just try try some other options. This is what I was talking about with the null sessions. This was really big on in, what is it, T? Uh, definitely Windows 2000. And you were able to do a command like this, net use, and you could point to the IP address and then a hidden share called IPC dollar sign with a blank username and a blank password. Okay. And with this, then you were able to, with other tools, you could actually, free tools, you could actually go out there and figure out what usernames and shares and all kinds of goodies were running on there. It was pretty informative. It's not always the most secure. Let's see. I mean, you could block ports. You could uh, ensure the local administrator accounts passwords are set. You don't want them to be blank. Good account block out policy, things like that. Okay. All right, so it was kind of fast and furious, but I'm trying to get through it. Hopefully you liked that part of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a five-minute break, and we're going to come back and do CISO. Okay, we're going to do, I think, two chapters in CISO, and hopefully I will... I can slow down just a little bit on that one. Okay. All right. I will see you soon. Uh, Five-minute break, and we will start back up. Uh, we're two chapters. So maybe this won't be too, too bad. Okay. It's going to be a little fast.
possible. There'll be some overlap. That's kind of the nice part. Okay. This chapter is uh, risk management. I'm assuming you can see my screen because I haven't pushed any buttons to change that. And we know we've looked a little of this with the CVA. In fact, they were talking about you know protecting our assets, the risk, and and to the controls that we can put in place, and trying to deal with the risk. We're never really eliminating the risk. That's a definite. Okay, so it's going to kind of cycle through the chapters, through the, through the chapter rather, and really kind of a key chart when you look at this. I mean, we're obviously trying to do the best we can. I mean, owners do want to spend as little as possible to get the job done because it's very important that we minimize our risk. We think of our safeguards, our countermeasures, our controls that we can put in place that try to reduce overall risk. We have to be aware of the various threats and threat agents. We're going to take it down a little farther and the various vulnerabilities that we do have. And so what the chapter is going to do is going to kind of come through and talk about some of this. And again, this part will be really, I think, more familiar because it's very similar. So when we think about an asset, I mean, you saw this in the other course, the fact that you have to value just more than what it did cost. I mean, gosh, I remember spending 5000 on a computer, and I think I could have given it away, or maybe I'd given it away. Sold it maybe for 250 if I was lucky, because technology changes so much. But you think about your asset, what did it cost, what it cost for to development well, and how important is it to you, how important it is to the bad guys and you know we kind of saw this one before and it's really important to think about what, how, how much we depend on it and what would happen if we didn't have it. Now the other course didn't break it down quite this far. We have the threat agent versus the threat as it is the first two chapters of CISO. The threat agent, the source, that's basically we could think of that as the hacker. It could be the entity that could adversely act on our assets. And whether it, I mean, it could be actually a person in your company who tried to harm you or a person in your company that, oops, accidentally harmed you. Or it could actually be a hacker on the outside. And it doesn't even have to be a hacker. It, it could simply be, well, our power went out. <laughs> our internet went down. You know, a tornado just wiped us out. So I guess I think of a threat agent as the entity. And I think of the threat as the action they performed. So basically a threat consists of an adverse action performed by the bad guy, the threat agent, or the bad guy, the hurricane, <laughs> on that asset. And they do show some things that could harm you. When you think, well, think of threats in general. I mean, they're listing a hack or it could have been a worm or maybe someone had privileges to do something like a system admin and they, they use it so much of the we use something like that. And we have these systems and we call those abilities. And maybe bad, bad features, not properties. And if you don't have a response, or mandatory vacations, where you can send people on vacation for a certain amount of time while you check them out and audit them and see if they've been doing anything fraudulent. You could teach, you know, people move into other positions and then maybe someone would discover something fraudulent that was happening. We try to put in place controls or countermeasures or safeguards, whatever you'd like to call it. If we're worried about people Getting into our system, we might have a firewall, we might have antivirus, or you might use spark cards to access given physical areas or get into the system. We have to think about the likelihood that something's going to happen. Okay. So it's sometimes to figure out the likelihood. And if we're talking about 
a particular weather pattern. I'm assuming most of you guys are from Texas. I'm trying to think, do you guys have hurricanes? Do you really get? I guess you do in Corpus Christi area. So um, yeah, maybe not so much inland. You probably get the tornadoes from it though. And you know, you could look at historically, maybe your town, maybe your Corpus Christi, for example. I've been to that base, and you think about the likelihood. Uh, I have a, have a hurricane coming through it, and that could be your threat. And that could be something that could harm you. And you got to figure out the likelihood based maybe on history. You also think about how much it could hurt you, the impact, the magnitude. Now, anything maybe you got hacked into. It can affect you financially. Maybe they stole a lot of money, but of course it's going to affect your reputation if anybody finds out about it. And it might just be put right into the news. And then it affects your reputation there. Now, when you think about the controls that you would purchase, in other words, firewalls, antivirus products, intrusion prevention systems and things, you look at a control from the perspective of functional. Does it do what it's supposed to do? But then that may not be enough. Does it do what we needed it to, to, to do for our purposes? We need proof that the control is correct, the right type of control to mitigate the risk we're concerned about. And is it adequate to do so also? I mean, it's not does it do what the package says it does. It might, it might do that, but it may not suffice for our needs. Okay, risk management. Again, we've talked a little bit already about risk assessment, response and monitoring. And we're, we're always trying to reduce our risk to something we can tolerate, something we can live with, because there is no such thing as completely eliminating there will be some residual risk left. And again, kind of just a rehash of risk. Do look at your company's assets and the values. and But then you take it further and you start thinking about what could, who, what are the vulnerabilities? What are the weaknesses? What are the bad guys? I guess you can think of threats in this one. And we do some calculation. We think of loss. We think of likelihood. We try to figure out an, an option, you know, a way to deal with this. Um, risk response. Okay, so we try to find something that is cost effective. You know, they want everything to be cost effective. I think this is thought through like a commercial entity. So, if what you could lose is a lot more, is a certain amount, and what the countermeasure you put in place is going to cost you to lose, you don't tend to do it. You might use insurance. You might live with the risk. Okay. But we do try to, you know, look at the cost benefit. We we evaluate. We think about risk monitoring, and and make sure that we're still good. We might be in an industry where there are regulations that we must follow, and we're basically forced to to uphold a certain standard. And we have to be ready to adjust. It's not like we create these plans and these responses and all and say, we've done it. We don't have to look at it again. It has it's something in motion. Okay, show that all the risk-based organizations are addressed appropriately. Everything kind of goes back up to management. Management is ultimately responsible. We use the term risk appetite, the level of risk organizations willing to accept. Because you're not going to eliminate it, but it's what, what can you live with? Because if, you, know, you may have great wish, wishful thinking of what you'd like to do, but the reality, maybe you can't pay the money out to, to reduce the risk to the level you really like it to be. So it is, it is based on cost, regulation, market expectations, so on. And, you know, how much money are you going to put into it to try to reduce this risk? So we can do a risk assessment. And when we do a risk assessment, it is based on that point in time, absolutely. And we do evaluate a lot of the same areas we talked about. That's vulnerabilities, likelihood, impact. Okay. And like I said before, it's a lot of unknowns. It's a lot of predictions. Now, this is this part we move a little faster because it is a repeat. Uh, quantitative, when you look at quantitative, it's financial. Qualitative, it's like if you've ever filled out a survey and you kind of put your opinion on what you, you thought, did this, uh, was it a good job, did it run faster, or run too slow, you know, whatever your opinion is, that's, that's qualitative. But some things have to be done qualitatively because you can't put hard numbers on it, like we said before, okay? And you can make up these different scenarios and get people together in the know and let them put their opinions forth. So this part we've seen before. Let's see right here. 
Uh, so first you start with single loss expectancy. Remember, you also figure out, well, they're kind of throwing a couple of these together. Boy, you know, everybody has different perspective of security, and maybe people don't feel secure. It is a perception, because they put emotion, perception, fear, unknown, controlled situation, or uncontrolled situation. Different perspectives of what they think security really is. I mean, really, managers, I think, believe that we are secure already. They may think that a lot of the products we purchase are already there already good to go, but they don't realize that they're probably pretty insecure when they first arrive, and that we do need to tighten down. And what they usually said, the word that's typically used is called harden the system. I think of it as like a hard shell and a turtle, or kind of just a, a big barrier around you to protect yourself. So we're always kind of going that direction where we feel fairly secure. Now this is the core of security, it's called confidentiality, integrity, availability. CIA, AIC, whatever you'd like to call it. It's important that we keep and with that, we, we try to do a lot of encryption. Of course, user permissions can be in there too. Confidentiality, we just want to make sure that you're not supposed to see it, you don't see it. At the same time, what if someone gets into the system and starts altering your health records at the hospital or altering your grades at the college? That would be violating integrity. Okay, so making sure the information is protected from unauthorized changes when it's between point A and point B, that's in transit, or when it's sitting on the hard drive, sitting there, that's called at rest. And of course, we're also important to protect availability. If someone is being hit by a denial of service attack and they cannot take care of their legitimate clients, we lack availability. Okay. And, you know, people have different levels. It's just so amazing. I've done a lot of classes over the years based on a, it's a DOD 8570 mandate. I've done tons of military bases. Okay. And they're the other extreme. They're the super secure. But, you know, someone asked a question recently, and I was just like, they got a good point there. They said, if these military bases are so secure, how can we still hear about breaches? I mean, I guess that just shows how hard it is sometimes to secure things because they are on the other extreme. Um, military bases would probably go, what I, you know, basically I've heard off and on is that, like their passwords would be more like 15 character minimum. when they use a password, but they also use a, a two-factor and they would go with complexity, authentication, like they dig into least privilege, separation of duties, all these uh, smart card and pen code. The things they talk about, it's almost like military wrote it. I mean, does it mean, you know, you still think about it, people can violate the security and get past a lot of this. I mean, even if you have good policies and people don't follow them, it just kind of gets thrown out the door there. So the whole idea, we want to think about the organization. We want to be supportive of its goals and mission, but we want to stay secure. Okay, information security management system. You know, you think about setting up a security program. That is a critical thing to do. Okay, that is something that we follow. And with anything, it is felt that we need senior management support for our goals to be met. Otherwise, I feel it's not going to succeed because uh, it's just kind of, a, I guess, a fact that's been learned over time. And we need senior management support, plus you need their financial, you need the money for them to support some of the ideas that you do have. There are different ISO standards out there, such as ISO 27002 that you could Google if you wanted to. It's all into information technology. It goes into uh, security techniques, code of practice for information security management. So it is critical that we have a security program. We could follow, we could learn some things from the ISO standards, obviously, as well. And we, we, we have to have something built because that gives us something to follow. You know, the procedures all come back to originally a policy. So we must have the security program. And it does break into administrative, technical, and physical controls. And that's what we're going to see. Okay. Now, before that, though, they're talking about goals that you might have right now and the midterm and the long term. When you think about 
operational goals. I want you to think of your day-to-day -day goals. And maybe your operational goals, according to this, keeping the production environment up and running, putting out the fires from hour to hour, making sure that everything is running well. Versus you may have some tactical goals that are more midterm, carrying out a risk analysis on the company might be something you plan on doing. It's not like a day-to-day -day thing. And then you might have a strategic goal, which these goals are ones that you're working toward, and maybe it's your full-blown security program. Maybe that's something you have eventually you're getting to. <laughs> but right now you're dealing with the now, which is the operational, and the midterm, which is the tactical, and the strategic is the long-term. Now, managers, management, obviously, as they put, mitigate risk, understand what risk is present and reduce it to an acceptable level. I mean, obviously, you want to do that. And at the same time, they want they tell you, I want it secure. But at the same time, if, if, you get, if it gets in the way of their user's productivity, don't new do realize they'll start saying something. I've seen it. <laughs> so security should not get in the way of productivity. So that's, that's a tough one. But if you don't have security, what do you have? That's a problem, too. It's got to, I guess, meet a happy uh, middle point. And it is true that management thinks that security is built into a product when that's not, not necessarily true. We know that products are good, but when we receive them, we must tweak them. We must configure them. Okay. So we think, I guess this just shows a picture of all the big, big things you need to do. Compliance. Got to make sure you stay compliant. Uh, you may have started out with some, you know, some ideas of who does what, security awareness, tools, processes, and and so on. You may have put together some standards and architectures and solutions, but you also need to make sure that you are staying compliant, that we are following this. Now, the three areas that were mentioned, we have the control types, administrative, technical, physical. Just on the screen. Physical is easy. You're thinking of some sort of control that may deal with you getting into a building. A physical control versus a technical control. I think of this as the computer people. The computer people may deal, we'll see it elaborated on in just a moment. Uh, computer people may be thinking about firewall configuration, intrusion prevention systems, antivirus, permissions. It sounds kind of like technical, technical slash logical. Uh, administrative controls has nothing to do with a computer administrator. Administrative controls deals with, I think of management, I think of human resources, it's more like people oriented. And you'll see that as we go through it, you just got to kind of see it. Here's administrative controls, policies, procedures, standard guidelines, managing your employees, testing and drills, risk analysis, management, uh, information classification, your users awareness training. So it sounds like something that deals with, I think, people and the policies, following the policies, testing things out. Just sounds more high level. Versus technical or logical, this makes me think of computer, you know, computer people, and we, we look at the configuration that we might do. We might configure our firewall, we might configure our intrusion detection, set up encryption, maybe a whole disk encryption on the computers, set up the appropriate protocols for encrypted communication, good strong communication, auditing to make sure people are doing as they should, and so on. Physical is easy again. You think of the doors that you use and you make sure you have, well, good locks on those doors, good strong windows, good strong walls. Maybe you've got an armed security guard. Maybe you have a vicious dog. Maybe you have a well-lit area which will deter crime. You think about environmental controls too. And making sure you know, that, that's important too. You're just going to see it kind of comes into it with environmental. Because if your servers get too hot, they're going to get messed up. And intrusion detection prevention systems, you can't have physical intrusion detection. And, you know, I guess it just kind of shows that we go through many milestones to get to where we, we want to be. Okay? You must measure that security program that you put together. And they, they want to make sure, how can you call it security or security program if you don't even know if you're doing it, if it's really working well. And we have to be flexible, too, because there are going to be new threats. There's going to be changes. There are going to be new regulations. I mean, HIPAA has not always been here. HIPAA requirements, obviously, have changed a lot for companies that, that are under that impact. Uh, we have more security breaches now than we've had before. 
program governance. I mean, everything goes back to management, by the way. They're ultimately responsible. We do need their support, and we do want to make sure that we want, we want to figure out that we are following our standards and make sure we get an audit to figure that out. Okay, roles and responsibility. We have senior management. They're very important. <laughs> and I think of senior management, they might be the leaders in this. Vision funds visibility. They are ultimately accountable, absolutely. This is the comment. Without management support, security efforts are doomed from the beginning. So they are, they're a critical part of this. There are terms, and I see their definitions they have here. I would add some more uh, viewpoints to this. You may, a person may do some vulnerability assessments and then maybe consider doing their due diligence, but then they could, they could continue and actually take action to, uh, based on what the, the vulnerability assessment said to do after they did their research with the due diligence, they could come back and put together some countermeasures and that might be exercising there. That's just a, another way to look at that. Now we have different systems. We have the person who owns the data, responsible for the data. They call them the data owner, okay? Responsible for a subset of data, data classification. They set the security requirements for data protection, okay? System owner. With that, they own, they're responsible for computer systems which might have different data owners that have their information on the system that you are responsible for. Or maybe you're simply kind of a system administrator type librarian type and that might be a custodian. You're given maintenance tasks over those computers. Or you might just be a regular everyday user. Especially there too. Now to make sure that we are following policy and doing a good job with our security program, we may have people come in or they have people that do auditing whether they be internal people or whether you decide to go with some outside people. Uh, it may be something uh, you're doing for, they got third party agreements, vendors, outsourced services, customers, and there's different job responsibilities. Security framework. Okay. With this, I mean, these are all components when we think of a security program that we want to make sure is in place. Okay. We have to classify the information for one. Make sure if we have top secrets classified as top secret or labeled as top secret, then you might just write a secret level underneath that. Information security policy. Okay. Everything we do goes back to management. That's the way it's supposed to be. Approved by senior management. And that way, if it's approved by senior management, they're on board with us and then it can be communicated down through the organization. To say it may be integrated with human resources or other policies that you have in place. But anything that you create, though, with a policy, you don't want to put anything into a policy that could be violating the law, for example. If you have something, a policy that there's a direct, direct um, problem with, then we need to not have that in there. And anything that you want to be in place needs to be in the policy. There could not be any assumptions. Okay. So we have to take, have some regard for laws and regulations and so on as it gets fed into our army type policies. And we do have standards, baselines, and guidelines. And we've seen a little bit of that already. And we're going to look at you know look at that more as we go along. Okay. So you want your information security policy, it says indicate management intent and priorities, right to the point. It should be high level. It's supposed to be something that just keeps changing all the time. It's got to be legal. And say up to date and relevant. Any policy you put in place, any plan you put in place, it needs to be kept up to date. It's not designed to uh, be just left and say, hey, we did this, we put together information security policy 25 years ago. It is just so great. No. Uh, you know, it does change sometimes, <laughs> but there, I wouldn't say it's it's good forever. Okay, it has to be reviewed. At federal. I think you have to set up a planned interval, or you won't. Somebody probably won't do it. it. Needs to have an owner, and of course, it's because laws do change. 
circumstances change. You may have merged with the company. You may have split. Your company may split off to, to others. Okay. Now, they're, they're showing your guideline, baseline, standard, and procedure. Okay. The definitions are actually on the page where the slide is in your book. And with that, when you think of a guideline, they consider that to be a recommendation, a suggestion, or a best practice provided insight on how something should be done. Okay, when you think of, uh, you can think of baselines too. Now the others of these are actually baselines. Okay. So baselines are product unique in that we establish our information protection baseline by employing and configuring each control. So basically they're calling this product unique. Okay. And when we think about standards, we may actually have standards where we say you will use, as I put it, ABC for your antivirus protection. This is our standard. You will use Norton Antivirus. You will use Microsoft uh, Office version, whatever. And that, that will be what you use. It's not optional. Now we have the procedures that still tell the step by step. I guess checklists could be considered procedures, but they are considered mandatory. And you have certain procedures to just spell out the, the nitty-gritty details that this must be done. Okay. Then they get into the human resources side. Can't forget the human factor here. And it is important. They talk about hiring and termination, enforcement, security awareness training. Yes, when you hire somebody, and of course as they work there too, and when they leave, I mean, you've got to have a plan. Absolutely. Because your people are the weakest link. Uh, because even if you have the greatest policy, there was one thing I remember now. When the student was asking about if the military is so secure, why do we have breaches? And I just kind of thought about that. We have the people. Even if you have policies that try to make things secure, what if someone just does something and violates the policy? They're supposed to do certain things, but they go ahead and do them. What if they're supposed to follow the policy, but they don't? And they violate the policy, then it kind of throws things out. So that could be why it happens. You've got the, the human factor. Someone could have been paid a lot of money to give up some passwords, to give up some information, and they basically violated the policy. So it's important as they manage your employees, infrastructure, all this is good. Acceptable use policy, I love that one. Acceptable use policy, you need to spell out what is okay and what's not okay. You cannot say to the user and get onto them when they've done something wrong and say, you did something wrong, and they say to you, well, where is it in the policy? And, and you say, well, it's not in the policy, but you're supposed to have common sense and know this. That's really unacceptable. I mean, if you say something's not allowed, don't assume it. Put it in writing. Show them, here it is. You signed the policy. It says you do not do this. You did this. You know, that, that's kind of what it comes down to. It must be in the policy. Now, we think about the pre-employment, oh, yes, and you do want to check into people because you might find you'd hate to hire somebody that did not have the skill base you thought they had. They have a degree and it could present a problem in the workplace for you. Uh, maybe if they're, maybe they're not clear of that yet. Maybe they have a that's not going to work there. You, some of these places actually check your credit because they have an assumption that if you have bad credit, that will be paid off. I know that comes into an account when you're looked at for security clearance. Validating, you really do have that experience, really do have that education, and, and those people that you put on there that think you're great and wonderful, make sure it's valid as well. Check them out before you end up hiring them only to find out they can't do the job. I've even seen, uh, before the termination, I've actually seen folks talk about, you know, kind of checking you out, making sure everything you're doing a good job as you go along prior to termination, that also. Termination. You might have a special exit interview. You may have a policy where you take them out and give them a box full of their goods. And unfortunately, it sounds kind of mean, but it could be safer because they may be disgruntled or just being fired. Or even if it wasn't a disgruntled and they're just retiring, you don't know down deep if they're really disgruntled. They could be saying, oh, I just dislike this company more than you can imagine. It's been the worst 20 years of my life. You never know. So... So with that, you might want to just take it safe and keep, you know, disable their account and escort them out and make sure they surrender everything. They can't just come back in and re or, you know, do some havoc on you now that they're separate from you. Because it could be unfriendly and you not even know it's unfriendly. 
and you know, human resources in general, it's good to have well-defined job descriptions. It's good to have people. It's good to move people because if there's any fraudulent behavior, we can discover that. Mandatory vacations we talked about. The fact that um, you know, maybe in a, a bank, in a high high relationship with a bank. You, they may want you to leave for a certain amount of time so they can audit you and see if you've been embezzling money. Now, that beyond the slide, the book talks about a few more. If we have gone with the idea in the book here of separation of duties, and you're able to do this, you're not able to do that, and you know, giving you the least privilege, just what you have to have to do your job, then if you wanted to do something fraudulent, it would probably be that you get with someone else and combine your job abilities. And we, we call that collusion. And the two of you together have enough power to violate the security. And there was a movie called Office Space where we in fact, oh yeah, job rotation. Yep, we got this. Okay. And there's different types of training that you can get. I mean, people obviously have professional training sometimes and you get the on the job training. But you know, as far as the security awareness training, this is good to be done at least once a year. First off, as you deem necessary based on your policies and procedures. Because people have to be reminded, I think. And you have to go and consider their knowledge level and, and their jobs and what they do and make sure whatever you teach them is relevant and vulnerable. Make sure it's aligned for them. Because you know, manager people are thinking about cost and compliance. Data owners may be looking for easy instructions. They say that are possible to be confused and takes a little time. And let's give a couple of examples. The users want transparent and easy. And you have different people, different levels. You can't do a bunch of technical talk and expect them to get it all. So, and sometimes you might spell out, this is what you're supposed to do. And if you don't, if you're not compliant, this is what, what will happen to you. And this is part of do care. You should be using liability cases if not performed. You could put things in front of them. You know, you could do uh, banners when they log into their computer that spell things out. You could say, here's your employee handbook, read it. You could put posters up. Personally, I think a lot of those aren't that effective. Uh, I, think, I don't know if I ever read the employee handbook I was handed. Okay, but in the banners, I think people ignore. But you, you got to get creative. You might come up with uh, some sort of security awareness training that you do during lunchtime and have a little bit of, you know, Finger food sandwiches there or something to have people show up. The same food they show up. And then event, you could go through kind of a show and tell and sort of emulate different securities. Posters, I've always thought were really effective, especially if they're interesting. But definitely do this um, annually. Social engineering, don't forget that there's a lot of power there, major power. Okay. In all these different scenarios, if you happen to ever read the Art of Deception or you know watch that movie Takedown, I think it's called Takedown by Kevin Mitnick. I mean, it's a little distasteful here and there, but I will tell you, it's a typical hacker mindset. But I was just blown away by how much social engineering was in there. I didn't realize he'd done that much because you know he did some technical attacks, but he had a lot of success by people just handing over. He was the hacker in jail, just handed over information to him. Oh, here it is. You know, and I remember I was watching some of it, and of course, you know, sometimes you might see the sympathy attack. Oh, I'm in a hurry. Could you help me? Or I could lose my job if you don't help me. I, I enjoyed the I it, the one in there where he praised somebody about something they created and how I guess they dropped the product the guy had made. And he's like, oh, so I appreciated that. Was a really good product you made. You know, and kind of that thing. So it's all like a little bit of psychology in this and you know, intimidation. I've seen that on enough television shows and phishing attempts. I've seen uh, bases do, Air Force bases do phishing attempts where they'll send these emails and they'll see how many of their users click on it. When they click on the link, it takes them to a site that says this is a test and they'll tell them that they messed up as well, that they shouldn't have clicked on the link. So it's really important. You know, it seems like some, you know, little thing you just give them a link, you don't fall for it. But I, mean, I think obviously we need to work harder at that. Policies awareness education. I think this is so big. Maybe they're, they're saying positive recognition for appropriate action. That would be nice. Be prepared for incident security incidents and make sure you are really are really have it together. And you know, just because you have not many people are following it. Okay. 
uh, you want to make sure that you truly do have support, truly do have confidence. You know, it's never said it would be easy. And just people need to know what's going to happen if they don't follow the policy. People, well, for their, you know, certain reasons, not follow the policy. So hopefully that was kind of an interesting chapter to fill in some gaps that we had not completely done before. All right. Are there any questions that you think you guys would like to discuss? Because we've actually covered the areas we need to cover, so chance your time. Assume you guys are still there. Steve, do you have something to say? How is it going? Still here? Okay, good. All right, well, just let me know if you have any questions. I'm basically going to stay online and let see if you need anything. Hopefully, you're enjoying learning all this good security stuff. You guys have gone through or are going through, I understand, the video versions of these and self-study. Some of you do starting out from the very beginning with the CSS, CVA, and now CSSO, and I'm not sure how high you're going to go. But you will get into the hands-on classes if you keep going with this. And those are kind of fun. <laughs> those are actually pretty fun. Okay. Okay. I'm going to try to answer something. Let's see who's in the meeting with me currently. I don't have anybody to ask that question to right now. But uh, if there's any uh, books or supplies or anything that you don't have, um, I'm just going to globally give this to everybody. Okay, there's a person named Steve Mays. I'm assuming he would probably be your best contact. Mays at multi.com. I'm looking. I don't see any of my people there currently in the meeting. And this is the email address for him. Of course, I'm going to give you my email address also. I didn't even tell you who I was. I just started, didn't I? <laughs> okay, this is my information. Diamond IT2 at yahoo.com. I have a mall to email and more thoroughly. So this one comes right to my phone, so I gave you that one. And my name is Tracy Preston. So I guess I forgot to tell you that little detail. But basically, if you don't get a response, if you're missing any materials or have anything, uh, Steve Mays is not my name, but it appears to be me right here. But I can contact him, and if you don't get anything back from him, which you should get something back, just uh, check with me, and I'll, I'll bug him. Sometimes emails have gone off to spam, and he's missed them before. It does happen occasionally. But yeah, that would get you with the main person at Mile 2 and the main people that could look at courseware concerns. Okay, so basically, I will stay online for questions if you have anything you want to ask. So, uh, so for those that are still there, are you, what, what other courses are you, are you set to take? Is anybody set to take any other courses? Anybody doing a CPEH or a CPTE, the Ethical Hacker or the uh, Penetration Testing one? Yes, yeah, so from here on out, it's just question and answer and anything you want to do for a few minutes here. Okay. And uh, just let me know. Otherwise, we're, we're done with the material for those that feel like they're done. So I know you guys are kind of moving your way out. So just let me know. Once it's, I'll stay in a, a few minutes to answer any of your questions you might have. Yeah, basically, you guys are doing the core courses right now, giving the, 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 the knowledge, the high-level knowledge. But then... If you do continue, I have no idea what your path is. Thank you. 
if you do continue, uh, there's there's like ethical hacker, there's pen testing, there's a okay, ethical hacking. Okay. And um, some people that may not be your thing, maybe more of in a management position, so you may not be interested in the hands-on side. But there's uh, there's digital forensics, network forensics, but again, just different ones. And yeah, we we put people through uh, the core. We always start here anyway. You know, you kind of get the foundation and built up from there. And some people take off in more of the management way, and some people take off more of the hands-on.